morning, listeners, friends, colleagues. Um, here we are. We're in London now, and um, we're in. The, we've got a privileged position of being in the boardroom in Donata, and uh, we've got a wonderful guest here today, Gary Morgan, who's the CEO of Donata Limited UK and Ireland. So, Thanks, Gary, Chris. how are you doing? Very good, sir. Very good. It's always lovely to be here, and um, for anybody that's had the pleasure of visiting the building, it's actually. I mean, it's it's inspirational, Gary. I I, I love the things that you've done. Um, but firstly, why did you agree to come on the podcast? Uh, really, Chris, because you asked me. We've been mates a long time. I've known you as I've had, I've had the privilege of working with you as a client for a number of years, and then latterly, just seen you around, and we've just been mates for a long time. So you asked me, it was no problem, Chris. No hesitation. I was happy uh, to do it. Ah, oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. The, the the kids and the grand granddaughter will be pleased when they listen to this one. Uh, but we have it must be twenty five years, or at least twenty five years. Yeah, I've been I've been years. in the aviation industry thirty six years. So. It yeah, and you be. would have been one of the first people. Yeah, yeah, no, and it goes so quickly, Gary. Doesn't oh, it? doesn't it just? Yeah. Uh, right. So let's 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 kick it off with how did you actually get into the business, Gary? Well, I was actually believe it or not, I was actually a retail jeweler. So I actually used to I was actually a jeweler for many many years, about five years, and uh, th- I actually left the industry and I was actually looking around for a job. Saw my brother-in-law who was a who was a um, he was a low controller at Service Air, and he said, "Oh, I said." I think they're looking for people to work in a bonded store. He said in PSC for the summer. He said, do you fancy doing that? So I said, yeah, I'll go and I'll give it a crack. I said, I can, I'll give it a try and see what it's like. So I went to work as a bonded stores clerk for Service Air in April 1983. My and I was only goodness. expecting to stay for the summer. It's amazing. That every, well, not everybody, but nearly everybody we've spoken to, they've either come into the business by accident or because they know someone or they live near the airport. But once they're in, they're hooked. It's, and, it's amazing, huh? And I tell you what, Chris, isn't it? Isn't it a fabulous industry? And I do believe it's still the case today. Maybe not quite so easy today. How can I start off as a summer temp in 1983 and end up in this exalted position, which I'm incredibly proud of? And I feel do feel very privileged. But when you think it's an industry that actually lets you work from a summer temp's position through every level, and you can actually arrive as a CEO, that's pretty special, isn't it? Some industry to be in. I think. I, I think so, Gary. And, and one of the topics, or one of the reasons why we're doing this, get to know the people behind the position, is so that anybody that's listening, whether they're on aviation or supply chain management or whatever courses, they'll get to know some of the people, and hopefully, some of the stories will inspire them. Some of the characters will will motivate them, and we can get the next generation into the business because it's so important. Oh, it, it is, and it's massively exciting to think there's loads of young talent out there. But we've got to find a way of marketing this industry to them. You know, it's. Uh, I think. I think lots and lots of teenagers know all about cabin crew and they know about being a pilot. But actually, you know, the, the stuff like working for airlines behind the scenes, if you like, then maybe they're not so sexy stuff. Yeah. Um, like ground handling, like fueling, like catering, really, really important roles. Um, but we've got to find a way of attracting young people in. But when they understand the whys, not just what needs to be done. But um, then it makes it makes people appreciate that, you know, for every aircraft that lands everywhere in the world, there's so much associated to it. Oh, there's a whole army of people waiting yeah. for it. Yeah, I mean, you, as a passenger, if you sat there and you don't really understand what's going on, you just, your aircraft rolls into stand, you toddle off the air bridge and away you go. Yeah. You've got no idea. You've probably just left 58 people sat on the ramp, all scurrying around, trying to get the aircraft ready for the next turnaround and out it goes again. Um, yeah, it's, I, and it fascinates me. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, it, no, it's no. wonderful to watch. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think... We, we had one person who said, and the ironic thing is, wherever you are, there's somebody else doing exactly the same somewhere else in the world. So in, in, that, in that sense, it's, it's a very mobile opportunity that people get when they come in. And if they want to travel, they can travel. And if, they, if they've got the, the, the character and the, and the capability and also the, the strength of, of personality to go and move to a different country, they can do so. Yeah, I mean, literally is. The world is your oyster, isn't yeah. it? If you're prepared to move, you can go anywhere and do anything. Um, and like I say, it's really about getting people in at the start. That's that's the key. We've got to attract the right people in. Yeah, yeah, no, that, and that's uh, yeah, and not just people that we're happy to do certain jobs, but people that we feel have got the opportunity and capability that if we nurture them correctly, coach them correctly, they can go on to bigger and better things. And I'm a I'm a big big believer that people have to have the practical experience, and I think that's so important for somebody to come in and embrace. I think that's absolutely right. But I but, and I think we do share the same ethos on this. But for me, the, w- the way we go about recruiting our people and selecting our people is about attitude. Yes. So, so yep. for me, you know what? It doesn't matter if you've never worked in aviation before. I don't, I don't really care. Yep. You don't have to come to me with 25 years of experience. Come to me with a positive, can-do, happy disposition. Because yep. if you do that, then basically there's no stopping you. We uh, can train you to do anything. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree, Gary. And, and and more often than not, people who come in and say, I've got 25 years or 30 years or, or whatever, normally they've got one year that they manage to survive for 25 years. Exactly with. so. And, and exactly I agree so. with you. As soon as you shake somebody's hand, look at them in the eye, and that first few exchanges of, of, of subject or discussion, you can normally tell somebody's attitude. And I agree, attitude is by far the best first impression you can get from anybody. Because they're ready to learn, aren't they? That's yep. the thing. If you've got somebody with a, with a good attitude, they're always happy to learn, they're happy to take, gain experience, and they're happy to do new things. They're not afraid. Yep. And that's, that's really the challenge for us is you find far too many people who think they know it all and they just want to hide away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or people who... And, and another thing is, another thing that, um, that, that, that... Well, one of the things I'm trying to do with a few people now for next year is, um, is actually train young people, but not academically but just in the best way to survive and improve and get to better positions in this in this industry. And um, again, you've covered you've covered attitude, but also this willingness to learn and understand that you don't get something as quick as that. Because now people are a little bit they want everything so fast, social media is so readily available. You know, there's a little bit of patience is also a virtue that people Absolutely, should appreciate. But, but I think then, that, 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 but that's beholden on us as the employer then. What we've got to do is show every individual that there's a mapped career program for them. Yep. So we can actually say to them, look, two years is a long time. But if you stick with us for two years, this is what comes next. And if you yep. stick with us then for two more years, this is what comes next. So it's really important that we're actually able to show everybody that there's a career path here. It's not just about come on in and then... If we feel like it in three years' time, we'll tell you tell you there's another role available. Yeah, no. So no. what you've got to do is demonstrate to people that they can build a successful career. Yeah. So once you get up to a certain level, then there's options. Yeah. Get to another level, there's options, and a lot of it is down to the individual as well. So it's important. Absolutely right. And one of the things we like to do is we like to monitor people's abilities. So we and we do we do database people's abilities, and it's a big project that we're working on now. Is so anybody in the world in the Donata organization can tap into this database and say, well, I need somebody. They can go in and say, I want somebody with the following seven key skills. Yeah. They put the skills in, and then the database will bring back people who've, who've got those skills already, already working in the organization, have already said that they're willing and ready to travel. Yeah. They're, up, they're up for the challenge. And then we can actually feed those people through the organization to where, to where the uh, opportunities lie. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's also important to understand that the majority of people, we want to be steady, happy, or, 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 or at least content, Yep. employees so we don't want everybody who wants to be the ceo otherwise you've got discontent because of the top heavy no my office isn't focus. actually big enough no so <laughs> yeah. i can't fit them all in either chris but no 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 it's but it's getting there yeah 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 but you but you're right and and i do think it's it's a thing i do stick to i want every employee who works for donata to go home happy at the end of every day yep. yeah they're going to go home tired they're going to go home slightly wealthier i trust but actually what i want to do is go home feeling satisfied they've actually done a good day's work and actually go home with a smile on your face because you know what if you if you ain't getting fun out of this, you shouldn't be coming in. It like I, any job, you know, you've you've got to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to give it your best. Yeah, no, I totally agree, Gary. And and also people to be content is important in this day and age when there's so much pressure on social media. And I've met so many excellent, excellent people that work for different organisations. And they, uh, you wonder sometimes, have they got the balance better? Because they're, they're enjoying doing the job because they know that that job they enjoy and it gives them the opportunity to do the things that they want to do outside of work, yeah. whether it be hobbies, whether it be family, whether it be whatever. And most of the people that, that um, we've spoken to now and, and people in your positions, everybody will say the same thing. So I, I'll ask you the same thing now. If, if, uh, if we were out in a restaurant and, and your wife was there and I was able to say to her while Stuart uh, left, left the room, what would you like to change in Gary? What would it be? Um, I think she'd probably say she'd just like to see more of me. So, and, and that's kind of, I think, a standard answer. I think, and the kind of the two go together. I get such a buzz out of my job. I do probably spend far too long at my job. I probably spend far too many hours here. But you know what? It's actually, it, it excites me. It's a passion. I really enjoy doing it. Um, so, and she does understand that. So one of the trade-offs that I think we all have to make is, and you've spent a lot of time away from your family too. Yeah, yeah. So the trade-off yeah. is always, look, if you ever need me, tell me and I'll be there. Yeah. So family always first. The job is important. The job's critically important. But if the family needs something, you've got to give them the time. Because yeah. without them, yeah, we yeah, can't yeah, do the yeah. jobs we do. Yeah. So, so it's only because we've got strong family uh, groups and family support that we can actually do these roles. They, they, anybody who thinks they're doing this all by themselves is living in Cloud Cuckoo Land. Yeah, no, no, it I, doesn't I happen. You, no, you've I, I, got I, I, to have good, strong people behind you, helping you on your way. Yeah, no, of course yeah. you do, and, and to respect that. 
like you said, most of the people, if if, if they've got a really a really uh, high pressured position, they're committed to it, yeah. and they also enjoy it. And the balance between enjoyment and commitment means that sometimes you probably do put too much time. All of us, all of us do. I have to send a picture to Cathy when she picks me up at the airport, <laughs> just so she knows she knows what I look like. But um, no, but but like you said, I agree with you that. But you always have to have to put the family first in in situations of criticality. So, yeah, but, but what you've got to remind yourself of as well, if you're a leader in any industry, you're carrying the responsibility for all the people that work for you indirectly, and that's not meant to be a, gl- a self glorification piece of yeah, nonsense. Yeah, yeah. The reality is, we've got two thousand four hundred employees here, and each of them have probably got two or three members of their family. The responsibility is that you've got to look after these people, and you're looking after them through the role that you do the way you bring new business in, the way you develop your business, and the, fa- the way you train them, the way you develop them. This is, you know, you, you've got to take your responsibility seriously. No, you're right. And, and we'll, we'll come to the training issue a little bit later. But one of the things you just touched on there, Gary, which, are, which is something that I'm really, really trying to push at the moment as well, is the word care. Hmm. Everybody uses it very flippantly and they can throw it away. But it's such a powerful word. Yeah. And, and when, you, when you're being treated by other parties, so you go to a hospital you're on the aircraft, you see the police, you see all the different types of, of support services, you want them to care, yeah. and you want them to care about you. Mm. Then sometimes when people are involved in their job, they don't care. Yeah. And and that, that fine balance of understanding and appreciating what that word means, and, and the acronym I use is uh, consider all responsibilities every time, mm. if you don't keep focusing on that, you can lose track, and then that's why certain standards start to drop and... You know, you just just look at the way people are treated in some of the shops and some of the businesses. It's it's not acceptable, yeah. and I think that's something that we also have to push at the front end and the bottom end of the training programs when we bring people in. You're absolutely right. And what we, one of the things, actually, a couple of things we're doing this year. Oh, oh sorry, we've been doing for a couple of years. We actually support local football club here, CB Hounslow, which is actually yes. now. Oh, you've seen that already. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so Hounslow Sports Club, um, and the reason we do that is because. We recognise, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to try and phrase this in the best way I can, because it's not meant to be any arrogant or, or any sort of aloof comment. In every major airport in the UK, you've often, you, you rely on major housing conurbations around the airport. Yep. That's where you draw your workforce, workforce from. Yep. Sometimes they aren't as nice as you'd like them to be, and sometimes kids are exposed to risk. Yep. And actually, I think if we've got our employees working for us and they're working hard and they're doing shift work, it's not always easy for them uh, to accommodate their kids' needs. One of the reasons that we support CB Hounslow is because every Donato employee's kids can go there after school. They can they can learn sport. There's coaches there. There's a safe bar area. They can go and sit and have a soft drink if they want to. All they've got to do is show their Donato ID, uh, and they've, they've all got passes that they can show. And actually, it keeps them safe, and the parents know where they are, and it starts to associate the family with Donato as a brand and with an organization. And that's really key for me because these kids are actually our future generation of employees as well. So we That's want fun. we want them to understand what Donata is about from a very early age. It's actually not just about it's a place where dad goes every day and he disappears for 10 hours and then he comes home. It's got to be more than that. If we can't mean something to the whole family, then we're not doing our jobs properly. So, so on Sunday, we just had a family fun day at Hounslow Sports Club. Brilliant day. 400 people came. Um, all brought the kids and we did face painting and st- stuff you'd expect. We actually screened the England game, which was a bit of a disappointment, yeah, but we screened it anyway. Yeah, there you go. Um, and it was just a brilliant day, you know, yes. and we like to do that for, for, the, for the team. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, I know you personally, so I know the sincerity in what you're saying, but it's, uh, it, it is, and it's a fantastic thing to bring the community in. Obviously, it's easier when you've got um, the acknowledgement of the Nata City. I mean, every, I, I travel so much, so when I come back in and I'm flying out of Terminal 4, I'm amazed, Gary, mm. at the transition over the last four years. I mean, it's phenomenal. It is fabulous place. And when it? you come in, when you come in, you know, all you actually do see really is Donata. Yeah. And we're very proud and of it. And it's Donata City. Yeah, and we're very, very proud. Well, Donata City West, that one now, because we're just building Donata City, City East. East. And we're building Donata City North, which is Manchester, so I'll come to that in a sec. Yeah. Um, if you're gracious enough to ask me about it, I'll tell you oh, all no, about no, it. Oh, no, no, we'll so, do. I've, I've got that down. But, but yeah, so, so 20, 2013 was when we first broke ground on the first Donata City, uh, which we're now calling West. And that was, that was a, a big risk strategy for the company. We, we didn't really know. And when, when I came into the business in 2012, the board said to me, look, we've committed to this. We've committed to two buildings. And I said, but you can have three. And they said, yeah, but we've only committed to two because we're not really sure whether the market uptake is going to be right. And I said to them, look, trust us, take the three. Because yep. I'm pretty confident with what we're about to deliver into the Heathrow market particularly, 
I think we can make it so different. I think we'll be. I just think we'll be bowled over with the re- with the response. And to be fair to the board, they said you've got three years to fill it. We were full before we opened. Yeah. And that's reality. We were, we filled three buildings before we even opened the doors on the first yeah. one. So it was a blow away success. It was unbelievably uh, well received. But I think that was because we said we were going to do things differently. And we really focused on our employees and our clients. No, no, I, and I remember Akers showing me the, uh, the, the the plan and the video that was being recorded every every week or every that's couple right, of the weeks. Time lapse. Yeah, yeah. As as have you you still you still got that? Is that, yeah, is that we, that's we, on your website? Is it? We've still got that, and we've got one running now for the North City East for the build that's going on now. So we, so we've put them in again because they were really successful. Oh, they're and great really, things to look at. Oh, they're fabulous to see these things come up out of the ground. They're amazing, yeah. really. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So so it was a really exciting time. And like I said, because Donald City was so well received, um, it was an opportunity for us to think about, well, what do we do as the next phase of growth? Um, one of the difficulties, as you know, around Heathrow is actually trying to get decent cargo property is really difficult. Yeah. Um, so every time an opportunity presents itself, we're usually looking at it to say, look, is this something we think can work? Now, we do not, and I, I really do want to impress this, we do not have a bottom spit of cash. Everyone has to have a business model that, that justifies yeah, 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 its yeah. existence. So they've all got to pay for themselves. They've all got to work. Um, but when you look at when you look at the results, Gary, so you're you're over eight hundred and fifty thousand tons. Yeah, yeah. So you're and you, you, you've three, gone above the million shipment yeah, number. Just, yes, indeed. Just to give you a scale on that, it was three hundred and fifty thousand tons in twenty twelve. Yeah. So that'll show you the rate of growth. Yeah, yeah. which is incredible. Yeah. But when you look at something associated with an airport like Heathrow. For people to be challenging forecasts, it's like when you see somebody building a, a motorway and they've only got three lanes. You think, well, why did you not put four? Why did you? Because it's go- it's definitely going to happen. So obviously, the, the way you've done it, but now also two almost two and a half thousand staff, twenty plus airlines. Your primary locations, obviously, we've spoken about LHR. So that's seven sites, mm-hmm. and you've got the eighth on the way. Yep, that's I right. mean that's phenomenal, man. Yeah, and that's due to open September this year, Chris. So we should take practical completion hopefully mid August. We've actually managed, what we've done is rotated, because it's the old CSC site, which yeah, you're yeah, familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we've essentially done, we knocked down the old building and we've rotated it through 90 degrees. So we've actually managed to get 240,000 square feet where there used to be 160, yep. uh, just by stretching the site a little. Um, so, and, and our custom, and it's for Virgin Delta. So they're moving in September. Um, so we go live September the 20th, I think is the planned date at the moment. Yep. Really excited about that. Yeah. No, it's fantastic, and and uh, and just 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 talking about about so many sites, etc. Obviously, you've got dedicated locations, you've got multiple customer locations, mm-hmm. so you cater for for for, for everything. Basically. Absolutely, yeah. If if a customer wants dedication, then we then we try and make sure that we can accommodate that request. Um, some customers are perfectly happy just to say, "Look, I'm quite happy to be in a, in a warehouse with with other clients. It's not a problem for us." So yeah, so we've got that mix of business going on, and with the design. Obviously, everybody everybody has trouble with designs of, of cargo terms, no matter where they are in the world. Yep. And as soon as they open, there's always there's always something that's not quite right. I think probably the most recent one that I haven't heard too much negativity about is is the new airport in Istanbul. Yeah, that seems to have gone very very well. It does seem to have gone very well. Really I think well. one of the keys is though understanding how you flow people around your site. So one of the key things we did when we opened Donata City was we said we looked at that traditional truck driver's journey. Yep. And we said, look, let's look at it from the client's client's perspective. Yep. So, yeah, you've been a client of mine in the past, and I regard you very highly as a customer. But actually, your customer manifests themselves in our facilities as the truck driver. Yep. It's the guy who has to come in and do the deliveries. He has to sit and he has to wait. Um, and it, it's, it's a pretty tedious process for most of these poor souls. So what we did is we looked at that and we said, look, how can we actually make that element of their journey better? So we, we came up with this gatehouse principle, this gatehouse concept, yeah. and we said, what if we actually created a flow where the, where the driver, he or she, never actually has to get out of their cab until they actually hit the warehouse door? So that's actually what we developed for the Nata City back in, back in 2014. So the driver actually now presents their documents directly at the gatehouse. They're immediately quick-keyed into our system, and then we send a message electronically to the driver's mobile phone which says go immediately to gate 24, whatever, door yeah, 24, yeah. whatever it is. At the same time, we send a message to the warehouse onto the handheld telling them that this driver is on the way around this vehicle, Reg, and this is the freight they're either collecting or dropping off. So by the time the driver gets there, the door's open and we're ready to roll. And that made a big difference. It was a big dynamic change for us, Chris. Well, it is, and, and it's a little bit like the Disney queues, isn't it? Hmm. That's the one thing that you, you don't realise when you're at Disney World or Disneyland where 
that you're actually queuing so long because there's certain phases and stages and you're involved. Yeah. It, it, it makes things incredible. Yeah. Now, with that system, Gary, the ready for carriage, yeah. what, what sort of accuracy levels are you seeing or what sort of discrepancy levels, should I say, are you seeing on ready for carriage? So when the, when the shipments come in and the documentation, what sort of error rate is there? It's not, it's not massively high, to be honest, Chris. I mean, I, th- I think actually the industry is getting better and better at this stuff because it, we are a learning industry and we do start... To, I do think we get better and better at this stuff every year. So I think actually um, RFC, uh, Ready for Carriage, is, is reasonably good these days. Um, if you ask me to put a percentage on it, I'd say probably 85 to 90% is always in a decent condition. It's, it's, it's received well and it's in good state, ready to fly. You're always going to have certain, certain consignments that aren't quite there. Yeah, and what about what about you know advanced data information and and then when they turn up with the dimensions volumetric against actual, uh, not as hot as it should be if I'm being honest, Chris. So um, electronic electronic data exchange has not moved at the pace we'd really like, and um, um, we're happy to champion that and work with any company in the industry who wants to work with us. We just think we've got to get higher take up on electronic data. We're, yeah. we're all wasting time, money, and efficiency. Exactly. Exactly. Rekeying data over and over again. Now, to be fair, though, for a lot of people in the supply chain, they're saying to us, well, what's in it for us? It's difficult for people to see where the real value is. Um, What we try and demonstrate is, look, if you're a freight forwarder and you're sending a truck in, we can actually move your truck around our site and back out again far quicker than we think anybody else can do it. That has to have a value, but only you can realize that value. We we can't. We, we We can aid the efficiency of that flow, but if your driver then chooses to park up and wait for another hour on the road there's not a lot we can actually do about that so it's actually about we can give you we can give you the opportunity to drive an efficiency for yourself but don't you think i mean just going back to the old days you know conditions of carriage and mm. and and prerequisites of what somebody should be able to pass and it should be accurate i think there needs to be a certain discipline at the front end and and both shipper and, and forwarder partnerships they must appreciate what's expected of them because at the end of the day that's part of the service yeah. uh, it, combination that they should be offering. Absolutely right, Chris. And what, what would be really nice is if, if I woke up one morning and somebody waved a magic wand and somebody had mandated that you can only you can only move freight by air if you've actually sent electronic data. Difficulty is for, for companies like ours, nobody really wants to be brave enough to make that call. Now, and I say that genuinely. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, can yeah. have a knock-on effect on your client base if you're not careful. And fear. So, fear is always a, co- a, a commercial handicap. It is a problem. Yeah, 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 it is a real problem. So, so I'd like to go out tomorrow and say, and I, I'm actually brave enough to mandate it, but I'm not entirely sure my clients would be that keen or that happy with me. I've actually tried to do yeah. it. Um, and what, so what, what about incentivizing? What about incentivizing the people who do? I mean, do you, do you offer them a fast lane? Or? We do. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely right. So, what we do is we say to them, look, if, if you are able to send us that advanced advanced information, we have. I think I'm going I'm to get laughed at by my team now, but I'm pretty sure that's what we call blue trucks. So at the, at the gatehouse, what the guys do, if we've got advanced information, the truck actually appears blue. Yep. And the guy in the gatehouse knows straight away, as that truck approaches, they know that that truck actually is, if you like, pre-booked. Uh, we've got the pre-data. So that truck actually is allowed to fast through straight to, straight to the door, basically. Oh, so, so, you, so you can cut out that bit of the queue as well. Oh, that's, uh, I think that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Because then at least people can see the, see the difference. Now that's so we've, we we jumped very quickly away from when you came into the business. Mm-hmm. So how did how did the career just develop? Just just very quickly, quick steps. Oh, okay. So I worked in the bond, I worked in duty free bonded warehouse for a few years, probably about uh, two and a half three years, I think it was. Um, and then basically the EU came along, which is slightly ironic, isn't it? That we're now talking and about now bailing out again. again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So happy yeah. days. We might get duty free yeah. back. Who knows? But yeah, that all sort of came to. It was also. I mean, it didn't actually end abruptly. It didn't fall off a cliff, but it kind of just started to wind itself down. So I actually moved to, so I was at Service Air at the time, so I moved to Service Air's head office. Um, I worked as an accountant for two or three years. Yeah. Um, I'd been a bookkeeper in a previous life, so it was kind of an easy transition. But I was desperate to get back into operations. Yeah. So the first opportunity I got, I moved back into operations in cargo, which was a whole new world for me. I'd never been in air cargo before. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so basically worked that way through. And when did you realise, this is the industry for me? Oh, what was what? Yeah, but what 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 was that defining moment or or turning point or person? So who you know who mentored you? Who did you who did you look up to at the time? Who did you think you know that that's that's why I want to be in this business? Uh, there's, a, there's a there's a chap who I think you know quite well, a chap called John Willis. <laughs> who was John the, Willis? Yeah, yeah. I, said, I was with him in Madrid. Okay, well there you go, and and you will know this individual very very well. Yeah, absolutely charming gentleman. He is absolute professional, a consummate professional. Yeah. And I used to I used to watch him at Service Air. I used to watch how he interacted with the staff. 
never heard him raise his voice, never heard him be rude to anybody, never heard, and just loved his whole management style and his leadership style. And he just kind of, he was just somebody I really looked up to and just thought, I, I really want to be like him. I want, if I ever get the chance to be in a leadership position, I want to behave like that. I want people to yeah. respect me, but I, but I want people to know who I am and I want them to know I'm the leader and I make the decisions. But there's no need to be rude, aggressive, hostile. You don't have to be what you don't want to be, you know? The, yeah. the, there isn't kind of... Um, I think some people think, oh, get into a leader pos- leadership position. I've got to be the kind of the big the big I am. No, just be yourself. Yeah, yeah. Just be yourself. And the I am's are not good. But talking about I am's, he's also lost weight. Yeah, he has. He looks fantastic. He does look absolutely phenomenal. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying, I, I think you already know, he had some diffi- he had some kidney problems a couple of years ago. Um, and, he, and, he man- and he actually was having a problem with his weight and he was absolutely determined he was going to shift it and boy has he really done a great job he looks phenomenal doesn't he yeah no he does he yeah. does he does I was, I was on the same table as him mm. and it was really really lovely to see him he looks so well great sense of humour and, and the character you described mm. now I can't not talk about the weight loss Gary mm-hmm. I mean you you were a big lad like myself, probably probably bigger. Oh, well, I was much bigger than you. And uh, complete, sorry, say that again. I was much bigger than you, Chris. Are you right. just doing that, for Kathy? Kathy. Kathy yeah. So when Kathy, you hear this, I was Kathy, much bigger than Chris. There you yeah, go. Definitely. There you go. Yeah. No, but seriously, I mean, it's it's incredible. Hmm. What, what, what was it that, that gave you that you know that drive, that motivation? Um, yeah, one of the difficulties is first of all understanding. I think why why we because all of us in this industry, if you travel a lot, you get you get yourself you lose your body clock. You get yourself into daft positions, so you eat at silly times. We're all working really hard. Actually, the first thing you forget to do is look after yourself. So for years and years and years, I just let the weight pile on. I just thought, you know what, I can handle this. It's not a problem. And then a couple of, about two and a half years ago, I was actually out. We were actually out celebrating a colleague and a friend's lunch, and I actually was struggling to sit behind the table. You know when you've got the table digging in your stomach and you think, oh, I really need to do something about this. I think I've been kidding myself for too long. Plus, I'm minded that I've been demanding of this business. I demand everybody in this business drives change every day. Yeah. And I sat there thinking, and you know what? What are you actually doing to change? What are you actually changing about yourself? So you're challenging your business every day and you're saying to them, go out and change. Get better every day. Move forward every day. And actually, you're sat there looking the same as you did 10 years ago. So how's about you have a bit of your own medicine? So I decided I would just try and lose a couple of kilos and see how it went. And I got really lucky. The weight came off, and I thought, I'll push it a bit further. And the weight came off. Started to do a little bit of jogging, a bit of bike riding. The weight kept coming off. So, yeah, so it's just, it's just been a fairly slow, fairly gentle process. But it's been incredibly successful. I count my blessings, mate. I'm really, really lucky. I had no right to expect the weight would come off the weight it did. But it did. But so I'm a very happy boy. You're saying slow and, and uh, Gary. It's phenomenal. So if people don't know, when, 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 when I was watching what was going on and mm. we met socially, I, I can remember probably three stone to five stone, those two stages. Incredible. That, was, that, that was incredible for me. Yeah. And my, now... And my heaviest, I was 24 stone. I'm now 10 stone 10. So, yeah, so... so 13 stone. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. It is, but then I, th- I part of me thinks, but you were stupid enough to put it on in the first place. So it's kind of, it, it, I shouldn't have let myself get to that position. But but yeah, it, it's the the loss is phenomenal, and I'm really really pleased about it. Have you not have you not had any of the family or any put put you forward for slimmer of the year or? No, no. They're, they're, everybody keeps telling me to stop. They're just like, stop, stop. Go and eat a sandwich. Go and have something. Like, yeah, no, no. But you, you mustn't you mustn't lose any more now. Yeah. But. But I mean, it's, it's incredible what you've done. No. Well, part of me thinks, actually, I wish I had done it now. So somebody, Because I think I should have kept a photographic record, shouldn't I? Yeah, because you've, you've got it. I mean, I, I, I've got one just from the, fr- fr- from the wall. The, you yeah. know, the, the wall of fame you've got in there with, the, uh, with all the pictures from the events. It, you can see the difference. It's incredible. Yeah. So, so it's nice. But, yeah, it's just, like I say, it's just part of my little journey. Mm. So, yeah, but, but thank you for noticing. It's kind of you to say. No, yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I can't work out whether it's inspirational or whether it's making me mad, Gary. Don't be inspired. Hey, listen, I never inspired. Or whether it's making me mad. No, 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 no. But anyhow, no. teach their own. Yeah, no, yeah. I've got, I've got, I've, I've got to do it. Mm. Um, another question for you. Now, obviously, that's a huge change in your personal uh, life, but you've, you've, you've impacted such a difference now in the in Donata. Mm. And uh, anybody that's had the the pleasure of coming to the head office, 
I mean, it's all it's, it's a lovely, lovely environment. It is a lovely environment, Chris. But if I took you to the, if I took you to any of our offices, they actually do look the same. No, as no, this. I've seen I've seen them because obviously seen them. the Qatar so, office with the gym and yeah, absolutely everything. It's a I, nice, nice environment to work in. One of the things we wanted to do was create that again, going back to this care care for our employees and care for our people, and making sure we deliver what we say we're going to do is actually about creating an environment in which people actually feel comfortable, uh, they feel safe, but actually they feel valued as well. So so the reason we put the gyms in was because some of our employees said to us, you know, I've got a gym membership, I never get a chance to go because I'm working shifts and it's a real nuisance. We said, fine, do you know what, we'll fund the gym. But we don't just fund it for our employees, we fund it for our co- airline customers as well. So if you walked into that, if you walked into any of our gyms, you're as likely to see a one of our customers stood next to one of our warehouse guys or one of our ramp agents or one of our check-in ladies. And you know what? They're all in there together. I and agree. it's absolutely brilliant. And there is no management intervention. We don't, we don't manage it. We don't stage it. Just say, look, guys, it's there for you. Um, we've also, in Donata City, in the original Donata City, we've got a thing called Delight, which is like a little coffee shop, come yep, yep. place you can get some food. Yep. And again, just again, to give our team the opportunity. They don't have to leave the facilities. They've got what they need around them. And it just creates that community feel a bit better. Yeah, no, and Gary, you've done it so well. Um, now, an, a, a, an, another little thing I wanted to uh, speak to you about. You've done, you've done so well with your designs, and obviously having seven sites, seven sites in London, eight on the way, um, three in Manchester that's that you're right, looking yeah. to you're looking to combine them all. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, Donato City North. So that's uh, that's been a project that Stacey and I have been working on for the last about the last three years, really. Um, but we're hoping to break ground before Christmas, and we should be operational August September next year. So that'll be nice. So that'll be actually taking our three facilities and putting them into one. So yep. It's about 150,000 square feet of build. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to that. It's it's a big, been a big challenge for us that one. And then, and then in Gatwick, you've already done you've already done a combination of the five units into one. Yep. So, so, and we'd love to do a new building in Gatwick. It's just at the moment there isn't the infrastructure available in Gatwick to do that. So, um, Gatwick functions really, really well. It's a great cargo operation, and like you say, it's five warehouses into one. And we were lucky enough to be able to take five adjacent warehouses in the end. Yeah. So we've been able to break the space through and make quite a bit of sense out of the flow. So but yeah, tactically, that, that, that was a good that was a good uh, good move as well, huh? Well, the point where everybody else was pulling out of Gatwick, really, yeah, exactly. and, and um, like I said, I, th- I think it, I think it's it can be very difficult for companies, can't it? That that yeah, at the moment we're seeing a little bit of fall off in the volume, so the volumes have gone a bit soft, and I think it's times like this where people can get a bit edgy and say, Oof, "We've got to shrink, we've got to we've got to close the business down." Anybody who's been in this business for any length of time knows that these things are always cyclical. If we're a little bit soft now, it'll come back. You've, but that's the time you've got to ride through it. You've yeah. this is the time where you actually. That's the time. Start training. Start thinking about start what you're supporting. Doing. Start, but but equally, don't though, start Gary, cutting. Start investing. Yeah, but some of the uh, some of the numbers. I mean, fifteen to twenty percent in most areas is is a bit of a shock, and it's a bit of a shock that we don't we don't act quicker, and we also don't react quicker because if you go back to the end of seventeen, most people didn't even realise that there was a such a huge surge coming. So, you know, we've got to get better at forecasting and triggering as well. So that's something I, that I do think it's difficult because I'm not sure actually we're I don't think actually we have a great communication line, do we, from from the from the uh, if you like from the shipper or from the from the principals, whatever product line it might be. We're never really considered as part of the comms line, are we? Yeah, as exactly. an airline or as a ground handler or as a service provider in the industry. You kind of find out third and it, sometimes it's difficult to react quick enough. Yeah, it's like so the tail of the alligator. It is. You indeed, see the head yeah. move and then... Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, you're right. We've got to improve that because we're all actually trying to offer a solution as part of the same product line. So we've all got to get better at working together on this stuff. Oh, exactly. So we've got to improve the comms. And, we've, and I say we've got to... People like us have got to be not afraid to invest in the right, pla- right place at the right time. Like you say now, it's gone a bit quiet. Start your training. So yep. do you get your training programs? Yep. Start doing your people development. Have a look at the infrastructure. Is there anything we need to improve? When we were busy, we didn't get a chance to paint those walls or change that driveway. That's it. Get out there and do it now. So that's actually what we're doing. We're doing some repair. We're doing some refurb. And we're saying, let's get ready for the next wave. Yeah. And psychologically, it's good for the staff because they also see the volumes down. Yeah. And if they see the companies investing in them and, and the surroundings, then they get confident that there's a good a good leadership and good tactical strategy in place, which yep. is important. Yep. Now, coming back to the facilities, Gary, you, uh, you know, there's so many people who put themselves up for experts in new facilities. Personally, I think that there's in more 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 times than not, there's over 
overinvestment in a lot of the facilities. And if there was more emphasis on, on efficiencies, productivity and grassroots understanding of how the business can work, then you're not, you're not wasting so much money. Now, you guys have done so much. Would you consider being like a, a recognised expert and put yourselves out to give advice or consultancy on other, other facilities? Do you think there's an opportunity there for you? Uh, there might be. I mean, to be honest, Chris, it's not, it's not, we didn't set out to do that. I think it's just it, our knowledge has just come through experience. So, and, and don't you learn very quickly how, oh, you, how yes, you're doing things yes, wrong? Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, so, so, so you notice the bits you do wrong really, really quickly, and then you kind of live with those for a long, long time. Um, we're actually assisting our colleagues in Amsterdam at the moment in a, in a fairly low level way, but but they're do, they're actually looking at a they're faced with a big new build challenge themselves. Yep. Uh, they're having to be re- relocated uh, in over the next three to four years. So um, Alex and I are actually assisting them and Akers as best as we can. Say, look, this is our experience. This is what's happened to us, and if we can help you in any way, just call on us and we'll tell you what we've done and we've been through. Got to recognise that every environment is slightly different. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, if we can help them, yeah, we're more than happy to. Whether we go as far as offering that as a consultancy, I'm not really sure. I've never really thought about it. I think, to be honest, Chris, we've got enough to keep us busy right now. We, yeah, haven't, no, we no. haven't really got a great deal of capacity because we're already programmed through until at least 2021 with new bills. Uh, so that's just finishing the jobs we've already started. So yeah. we've already got another couple of years yet of our own work to yeah. do. No, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you should do, but it's a, it's a, it's a great um, resource uh, capability. And, and, you know, for some independents... Who need that little bit of advice and guidance? I, I just thought it was, you know it's a great reservoir to come for a drink from, and uh, be happy to help anybody. You know what I'm yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, and like I say, we'd be happy to show anybody around. They can come and see what we've done. Like I say, if we can assist, we're more than happy to do that. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's good. It's important for people to know that. Now, another another thing, Gary, and and something that's impressed me is, and and I don't know where, every time I say this, I don't know whether it sounds right or not, but I'm a big believer needs to be more youngsters coming in and youngsters for the right reasons and coaching them but also our, our, our female colleagues and ladies because I've been so so impressed with, with with so many ladies that I've met in the industry and I'm thinking to myself why now is there not more I, mean, I know you, you're a um, similar believer they, they think differently they act differently and they've got certain very different drives but you've got you've got a huge um, female team here and, and people that I've watched and I've met from when they first come in so You've got Alex, and I know it's spelt in a lovely French way, but uh, the easiest way to pronounce it is do I know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a, she most certainly does know. She does indeed. She does. And then you've got Stacey Shortall, mm-hmm. uh, which obviously is also linked to the business, but she's, I mean, she's been around a long time now, huh? Yeah. So in I senior think- positions, but from, from a very, very young age, because yeah. I, remember, I remember back, back uh, in the early the days record, up in Chris, Manchester. And I would like to say, as this has been recorded, they are both incredibly young. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to know that. No, no, yeah, but so, they look. So let's not have any suggestion there and get clocking on a bit now. No, no. But yeah. irrespective, they both look so young as well, which Absolutely. is incredible. And then you've got... That was the right answer. And then you've got Sarah yep. Barndale. I mean, I've never met such an efficient, communicative, positive lady. I, it's I, always been one of the best first impressions of a company I've ever, ever, ever had. Seriously. I've, I've got to tell you, Chris, I am absolutely blessed with the colleagues that I've got. And like I say, the girls are just phenomenal. Um, I have two COOs, Stacey and Alex, as you've said, Absolutely brilliant. I couldn't wish for better. And they are phenomenal. And they drive the guys in the team. They drive all of us a totally different way. They do, Like you said, they think differently to the way I might think or the way Akers might think or the way Simon or Chris might think about things. And that's really interesting. It brings a fantastic dynamic into the boardroom. Yeah. So when we sit and have meetings, they challenge us. And they challenge us all the time. And one of the, things, one of the key things about the way we run our business is, although Akers is the head of commercial and Simon is the head of safety and Chris is the head of finance and Alex and... Uh, Sarah, like say, are the heads of the of the operational business. Everybody challenges everybody else on their business. So there's no, we don't silo. What we do is we say to them, look, if you want to challenge finance, feel free and challenge finance. Yeah, that's healthy happy, though. Get in there and finance. If you want to challenge commercial, you feel free. Yeah, but that, that, I mean that's the way it should be, Gary. Yeah, pe- people should. I mean, people are talking about or using the word disruptor. It's a, it's a shame the word sounds so negative. It's a, it's but a, a disruptor, a, a disruptor can be the most positive person in the team if it's for the right reasons and and it, and it makes sense but the, to be challenged is effective it's good and i think it's about the strength of the team you know the thing is you break us apart Confidence. And individually we're good but together well, i think we're phenomenal i really do and i think it comes from the strength of unity that the team creates for itself and actually they're all looking out for each other all the time they've all got everybody else's back and they're all looking out for the business and that's a real positive and that's actually what gives the business its strength 
is, yeah. is the strength of that team. Plus seeing plus seeing the way things have developed and, and, and gone on, which is incredible. And another young lady I shouldn't, shouldn't forget to, to, to mention is also Fenella, uh, Fenella Sloan as well. So. Oh, yeah, our, our commercial star. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, worked with, uh, I worked with Fenella at Menzies. And then we were desperate to get her across here as soon as we, really, as we got Donata up and running and got, and got it yeah. underway after we bought. Because, of course, you know, Donata came into the industry by, by, by buying, buying plane handling. Yeah, yeah, I remember. So George, then, George and, and, uh, and course, yeah. poor old Gwyn, God bless him. Indeed, yeah, God bless him indeed. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so we got Fenella across at the first opportunity. Um, she's absolutely brilliant. I tell you, there was nobody better on commercial contracts. So commercial, commercial marketing, that yeah. was doing for us, and absolutely great. No, and again, no, no. chasing the boys around the office, making sure they do what they're supposed to do. No, I remember. I remember she was, yeah, she's very, very good. So you, you are blessed indeed, sir. Mm-hmm. Now, leadership, mm-hmm. okay? All good leaders have made big mistakes, mm-hmm. but the best leaders have learnt from them and are not frightened then to make more mistakes. Mm-hmm. Can you put your finger on anything that you think was a big, a big learning uh, experience for you? that sort of changed the way you looked and, and gave you the confidence to do what you've done here in, in, in Heathrow? Um, that's a really interesting question. It's a good, it's a good self-challenge. I don't, and this is not meant... I, I've struggled to think of a particular incident where I can say that was an absolute disaster. But the truth is I make so many mistakes in the course of every day, Chris, I can't even begin to tell you. And I like to... Each one is a learning curve for me. So my ch- the self-challenge for me is... You can make as many mistakes as you like because it means you're making decisions. So don't be afraid to make decisions. That's the exactly, first challenge. Exactly. If you're making 100 decisions a day, you're going to get some wrong. Don't make the same mistake twice. That's the, that's the challenge to me. So I don't mind getting something wrong as long as it's recoverable. Yeah. Um, but what I then do is say, look, let's learn from that. Let's make, some motion. Let's make sure we don't do that again. So for me, it's about, it's almost a continual improvement, I suppose, rather than, Focus in on negatives about things we've got wrong. We get stuff wrong all the time. Yeah, little yeah. things. And, and I it's know always got to be manageable, hasn't it? It's about scalability. I don't mind if we get it wrong as long as we learn. Yeah, yeah, no. And I know, I know you're you're uh, you're an advocate of giving people the opportunity to make decisions because even Absolutely. if they do make mistakes, as long as they learn as well, Gary, it's part of it's part of succession. It's part of their development as well. And what really disappoints me, Chris, is um, I hate I hate seeing managers at whatever level, brought to task three days later for a decision they took on a wet Sunday afternoon when they were on their own trying exactly, to run a piece exactly, of the business. Exactly. And they only had available to them the information they had available. Now, the fact that I know something different the following Wednesday doesn't mean that I would have made a different decision on the day. And we've always got to keep that in mind and say to them, look, as long as you made the right decision based on the information you had at the time, we can't be critical of that. Yeah, no. You've got to encourage people. There's nothing easy. You switch people off so quickly yep. if you're not careful. Yep. It's a tough life. Being a manager is difficult no matter what industry you're in. Yep. You're on your own and you find yourself on your own a lot of the time. You've got to know that you've got the backing of your team. Yeah, and that's why over the years, and it, and it hasn't changed It hasn't changed that much, when something goes wrong and you ask for a hand in report, I, the first thing that drives me mad is when somebody says, We've identified the person, we've disciplined them, yeah, and this awful. one's been terminated. I just find that. I, I, I personally would like to say, with the greatest respect, you've written this letter, I totally disagree, and I think you should resign. Yeah. Obviously, you can't do that, but, but, but mm-hmm. I just find it so bad that they don't address the process. They don't address their own training yeah. uh, programme. They don't address how they coach their people. It's such a terrible because thing to say, just, we're going to dismiss them. There's just a reluctance to look in on yourself and say, yeah. actually, did we play a part in that failure? And, that's, and I think we do that quite well. We're not perfect, but we do do that, I think, better than a lot of people. One of the things that we do, if we do have an incident, and it's a fairly major incident for us, we don't, we don't yes, of course the employee is going to be taken off and they're going to be investigated and we're going to have a conversation with them. But actually we won't dismiss. Often we'll actually put them, what we'll do is bring them back to the business, but we'll put them in the crew rooms and they'll talk about their experience. And what we actually do is make them a champion. They relive their experience to their colleagues and say, don't get into the position I got into. These yeah. are the mistakes I made. This was the consequence of my action. Don't put yourself in the same place I yeah. was. Outlaw, so we actually outlaw use it as a positive. Sheriff. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and it, it works really, really well. And that's a good. That's yeah. that's that's really good, Gary. That's <laughs> that's better. That's mm. better than good. I really like that one. Now training. Mm. Now I'm a big believer as well, and 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 looking at kids and 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 you know, youngsters. And um, the way they spend so much time social media, everything has to be fast, it has to be visual, it has to make sense to them. So I'm a big believer now, we've got to start steering away from so much time in a classroom. 
and we've got to do things in a different way with apps, with videos, yeah. with regular little sound bites or little bits and pieces, jigsaw pieces, whatever you want. They are always pumped out, pumped out, pumped out. Always tested, so it's competency based. Well, what's your opinion on that? Apart from obviously the regulatory, like the DGR six or whatever Cat six training, but everything else. What do you think? I do I do think it's an interesting point you raise. And I did actually have a really interesting conversation with somebody a few months back who was who was explaining to me about, you know, you know these kind of Gen X, Gen Y um, yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. Um, theories. But what he was actually saying to me was really interesting. He said to me, there's actually a generation of, of young people now, if you like, kids, call them what you like, who actually will probably never really want a 40-hour or 50-hour a week career. Because yep, yep. Their, their focus is not, they're, they're not, they've not been educated that way. They've not been brought up that yep. way. Their whole lifestyles are actually about, it's about short focus attention. So they're saying, so it is very app-based, very technology-based. So they're saying, you've got to think in your organization about how you're actually going to embrace those folks 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Because they aren't going to want to come in and do five shifts and have two days off and then come back for another five shifts. What you've got to do is work out how you use them for four hours on a Monday afternoon and then you might not see them again till Wednesday because they want to go fishing or they want to go skateboarding or they want to go shopping on Tuesday. Yep. So, yeah, it's a really interesting challenge. And you're right. The way to deal with this is it's going to be through through sort of app learning. It's going to have to be through increased use of social media. Yep. That, that, sort of, um, that sort of networking um, sort of um, background, if you like. Yep. And we're going to have to educate and train that way. So we are going to have to change completely our philosophy on classroom training. Yeah, yeah. Which but like I say, big. apart from regulatory, which is always we're always going to yeah. be bound by by the government on that. But yeah, we've got to get we've got to get faster. We've got to get smarter. Yeah, no, I agree. E-commerce mm, confuses me, Chris. I've got to say, yeah. I, know, I know I know you're sort of looking at me with a big smile on your face. I haven't got a clue, mate. E- it's e-commerce. No, is but just it's good. It's good that you say that because Gary, airlines, ground handlers, <laughs> everybody. They're getting they're getting wet because it's continually coming over over like an infinity pool, yeah. and and they think they're swimming. They're it's not. The, it's it's the, just it's, it's just, just a luck. buzz, isn't it? It's just a buzz. And the thing is, to me, what is e-commerce? I I I asked the question again and again. Tell me what e-commerce actually is, because I'm a little bit confused. I think I know what it is. I think I know what you think it is, industry. But for me, isn't everything we do now for e-commerce? Yes, arguably to a, to a greater or lesser extent. I think there is this kind of, there's this perception the Amazons and the Alibabas have suddenly created this whole new world of e-commerce. Um, I think all it, I think what it probably is is a macro version of what we've been doing for years. Instead of it being in 24 cardboard boxes and you can't really see the content, they're actually breaking it down to a slightly different level. And I think that's what the airlines are looking at and saying, well, can we get a grip on that, that market? Yep, yep. Now, I think, yes, you can. But it's not something that comes along as an opportunity when you've got a ton of spare capacity. Yeah. If you're going to commit to it, you better be prepared to commit to it lock, stock, and barrel. Do you actually want to give a whole chunk of your aircraft hold out to this sort of market? Yeah. Because actually, the yield is never going to be great. If you think about the supply chain, nobody's going to pay you pounds and pounds and pounds a kilo to move this sort of stuff. You're talking fractions of pennies. It's not, I don't think, a massively um, big yield market, but... I say I'm talking to you with a fairly limited knowledge about this because I'm not really sure what everybody's chasing here. Yeah, but the volumes, the volumes are, yeah, you know, they're just going to keep rolling and rolling and rolling. So some people, I think, incorrectly, are seeing it as a little bit of a safety net now because of the way the the, the traditional business is going. And 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 when you see that, and you're always relying on the safety net, it doesn't make you do things differently. And I think one of the big regulatory items that's going to come up now is to do with the safety and the security related to this business because of the declarations, because of the hidden hazards, because of the screening techniques, all of those things now are going to are going to come into being and and if they do, if they don't then the authorities and the regulators IATA included ICAO everybody they're not allowing a, a level playing field. No, that's absolutely true and, and, and that and has to change. And right. the postal the postal services have also got to look. I see I've I seen one advert which um, it had a box and it said, with us, one pound is one pound. With alternative modes, one pound is 11 pound. Why spend more money for the weight of your goods? And it's just a, a play on the, you know, the dimensional charges, etc. It's not, I, I don't think it's good for the business. No, I agree with you. And I think actually, just picking up your point about some of the safety risks um, in the business, I was talking to my colleagues in Amsterdam where they do a huge amount of, I'm yeah. going to say mail for want of a better word, uh, but it's this sort of small parcel stuff. 
and they've actually got containers of stuff that they've actually intercepted. Um, you know, guns, drugs, yeah. stuff, you name yeah. it. It's Lithium all batteries in, there. in, in yeah. all oh, sorts there's of... There's all sorts of stuff in there. And you're right, regulation has got to improve on this stuff yeah. because at the moment we are shipping an awful lot of nasty stuff around that we, we probably can't see and we're not aware yeah. of. So you're right. So first of all, we've got to get better regulatory control on that. Secondly, I think we've got to really understand what we want out of this market as an industry. So I think, I mean, if we went back 25 years and we were sat talking like we used to, one of the conversations we would have had is integrators, the rise of the integrators, yeah, they're going to yeah, finish yeah. us off. Chris, yeah, they're yeah. going to finish us off. There'll yeah, be no yeah. general cargo 20 years from now. Well, they've got stronger. We've got stronger. So I think e-commerce will sit alongside general cargo, if you like, from, from one of the traditional air freight. Whether it will actually replace it completely, I'm not oh, sure. No. Yeah, I think at the moment, I think it's kind of, it's all, it's almost a... It's a tsunami coming over, yeah. but everything grows after a tsunami. So it does. It has, has some yeah. damage, obviously, but... And I think it's not probably not that dissimilar to the pharma rush of two or three years ago and kind of this yeah. whole kind of, we got the same sort of role, didn't we, with pharma? Yeah, but look what's happening now with pharma. Yeah. And, and again, I, I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticising anybody. I, I'm, it's just my opinion. People have over-invested in such expensive pharmaceutical facilities. But at the end of the day... We don't want to be storing it. No, and we've we've had that same demand, Chris. So so some of our bigger airline clients have said to us, "Look, you really need to look at this because this is something we really want to market. It's a, it's an area of growth for us. We've got to have pharma store. So we've invested heavily in pharma stores in our facilities. So we're actually blocking out twenty or thirty pallet positions in ETV system where we're putting temperature controlled uh, units in. And to be honest, most of the stuff is travelling in temperature sensitive packaging anyway. Oh, exactly. And your point is absolutely right. Exactly. You don't want it hanging around for two and a half days. You want it in, you want it cleared and you want it gone as fast as possible. And from the farmer perspective, they want to see how you're handling it as soon as the aircraft lands and the door opens with the temperature uh, changes. They want to see the whole the whole supply chain, not just that you're capable of once it gets to you keeping it in a certain temperature. I I I just think so many people have invested so much money for them to get a return on that now, it's crazy. Whereas if they if they looked at the front end and the middle and the whole supply chain, it would have been better. And, and better you know utilized. this as well as I do, Chris. The truth of the matter is, without revealing any commercial sensitivity, we don't charge any more really for pharma. Pharma to us is just general cargo. So it doesn't really matter what the product is. Our rates are basically based on kilos. So if it's a kilo of pharma or a kilo of leathers, it doesn't really matter because we're going to charge you the same amount. Yeah, but I think that has to change as well moving forward, Gary. I think it's got to be looked at. You know, it's got to because of the, 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 the one thing that pharma has brought in is it's brought in a different level of training, capability, competence and, and consistency and continuity. And risk, Chris, and that, as well, if you get yeah, it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, the, these shipments are not cheap shipments. Oh, and that all costs money. Yeah. That all costs money. Now, Gary, just uh, before we wrap up, how do you, how do you spend your spare time? Because obviously you need to wind down a little. What do you do? What do you do to get away from it? Um, obviously, I like to spend time with the family, and I don't get enough of that. But I, I do like getting back home and seeing the family. Um, I like messing around with old cars. I'm a bit of a grease monkey, so I love getting the spanners out and tinkering around with a couple of old cars I've got. Um, like listening to music, like watching TV. What's like the music? Read. What's the music, or what's the one song that would get you up anywhere? So if I said, if I said, if I said to your 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 better half, mm -hmm. what if you put on at a party, at an event, or if it was in the car, would you see Gary go into a different place? What if, would, the, what would you, that be? If you rang my Julie now and said, would you want to see your husband dance? She'd fall about laughing and say, don't ever get him up on a dance floor because he's got like zero rhythm. So no, she I think that's common in cargo, mate. I tell you what, I'd, dad dance, you watch me yeah. go. So no, she wouldn't want me dancing at all. Um, it's kind of difficult for me to say. There isn't... I have a really weird taste in music, Chris, that's the truth. So I will listen to, I'll listen to opera, I'll listen to classic, I'll listen to hip-hop, I'll listen to r and I'll listen to Frank Sinatra. Elvis blows me away. I absolutely adore listening to Elvis. Let's, so let's stick with Elvis, because I'm a big Elvis man. Right, What's okay. your favourite Elvis record? Um, right, I've got so many. I love the way, well, I tell you what I really like about Elvis. So I'm gonna, it's a long-winded answer, Chris. I really like his version of Hurt. I think it's a phenomenal song. Yeah, yeah. You know the old Johnny Cash number? Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. the reason I like it is because it's probably one of the few tracks, if you listen to Elvis, and what most people don't hear when they listen to Elvis sing, is the emotion and the range in his voice. The guy had an, a phenomenal talent, a phenomenal talent. All people see is the jumpsuit and the big hair and the sideburns. Forget all that. That's just, that's just Las Vegas. Listen to the guy sing a song. He's absolutely amazing. His voice is phenomenal. I love him. I love him. And funny enough, last night I heard a song that I'd never heard him sing before, which was um, un, 
before the next teardrop falls. All right. Yeah, but it was originally by Freddie Fender. Yeah. Okay, but what well, I mean, it's a simple song. It's a lovely little song. But the way he does it is incredible. Yeah. Listen to him, and also listen to him sing a song. Uh, he does uh, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled yeah, Water. Yeah, I've heard that. That's, what yeah. a fabulous rendition he does of that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. He's phrasing. But I tell you, I like Frank Sinatra as well. I, I, I actually like the construction of music rather than the music itself, which sounds a bit weird. I love listening to music that's very cleverly constructed. So uh, when I listen to Frank Sinatra sing, I love to listen to his phrasing. He tortures words. If you listen to him closely, he'll twist the word just because it suits the verse. It suits the rhyme that he's trying to get across. He'll break a sentence mid-sentence. He puts a pause in where there's no pause in grammar, and you think, what are you doing? Listen to the song, because it all makes sense. When he, when he sings the song, it's just there. It's just natural oh, to him. You can't, you can't train it. You're a, lot, you're a lot deeper than me, my friend. I just, I just love anything that makes me feel happy. Or, uh, but, but Elvis, I'm, I'm a big... I used, to, I, used to, <laughs> I used to make my son and his you friends... You and me with the jumpsuits this Sunday, Chris. Let's oh, get them on. Mate, yeah. I would happily do that. Yeah. I would happily do that. But I used to make my son and his friends listen to Elvis, and they still say, oh, my God. But they do like Elvis now. Quite right. Too. My yeah. daughter loves Elvis as well, because I did the same. She used to say it was child abuse, but she's got the hang of it now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've never heard it called that before. <laughs> yeah. um, Gary, now, listen, one thing just before I finish one of the things that I, I try and do is I try and put down a title of a book if it was your biography or whatever so I just try and come up with something I've, I've actually got something now okay okay which I'll tell you in a minute but before we get to that if you were to if you were to be giving out a commercial now for youngsters to listen as to why they should come into this business mm-hmm. Donata but this business in, in, in Maine what would your quick commercial be? Listen, this is a fantastic industry. It's really exciting. You can build a career here, and this is one place you can build a career. You can stay here for the rest of your life. You can progress. You can become a senior manager if you want to be. If you just want to be at a certain level and you want to stay happy there, we can do that for you too. So we can cater for everybody's demand. If you want to work shifts, you can work shifts. If you want to work regular office hours, you can do regular office hours. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to make you happy. We're going to make you feel fulfilled, and we're going to make you contented. You're going to enjoy life. As much as we can at work, we're going to help you enjoy life. And we're going to give you that work-life balance. Yes. I've got my CV ready, Gary. Right, you've the got book. The, you've got the job, mate. The book. Right, I've put it down. Can the I ti- tell you what my job title is for my autobiography? Before yeah, you yeah, tell me what yours yeah, yeah, is. Yeah, go on, go on. I think I got away with it. I like that. Thank God you didn't pick that. I'd oh. have been gutted if that's the one you'd come up with. Nah. Yeah. I think, I like that, Gary. Mm. I got, but it's... That's tongue in cheek, mate. You've done very, very well. Your no, no, your no. your pedigree, my friend. You've done well. So I, I do you know what for the last forty years of, I thought yeah. somebody's going to tap me on the shoulder one day and go, "We've just sussed you out. Nah, nah, you've got Gary. no idea what you're doing, lad." Nah, Gary, you've done well, son. So, sorry, so, mate. I interrupted you. So go on. No, no, no. You've done you, yeah. you've done very well. Mm. I it, it, but it could still stand depicting all the positive and all the changes that you've made. So it's not just about it's about you. Okay. It's about what you've done. So I think it's right, that's, fair that's the way I would see it, yeah. not not the other way. Um, but I've got I've put down a jeweler in Donata's crown, a man who changes himself as well as his business. Oh, that's that's nice. I like so that. I've got that down for you. And Gary, I've got a huge amount of respect for you. From the very first time we had to negotiate a few contracts back back up north, which still, was my I've still first, got the bruises, Chris. Yeah. That was my first overseas posting, yeah. um, but really, really appreciated it, and it's always been a pleasure. And thank you so much. Brilliant what you're doing, and continued success. Thank you very, very much for coming on board. Oh, listen, thank you very much for the opportunity to sit and talk to you. It's been fantastic. It's just like been catching up with you. This has been long overdue, and I've had a wonderful last... I don't even know how long we've been sat here talking, but whatever it was, it wasn't long enough, buddy. No, no, I appreciate it, mate. It's really good. Now, if anybody wanted to get in touch with you, obviously not your your personal email, but how would they get in touch with you? What's the best way for them to get in touch? I just drop a note through to my PA, Sarah. So, sarah.vondell at donata.co.uk. Just drop us a line. We'd be happy to talk to anybody. Brilliant. And what we will do, Gary, is we're doing a series of specialist subjects after we get to know the people in their positions. So uh, we'll definitely be getting back in touch with you. All right, it'd be wonderful, mate. Look forward to that. Really, Thank you. really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Lovely. Yeah. Bye now. Bye.